with me, buddy. Lord, been good to me. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles this evening. Give me a little spark there. Jump me off. Titus chapter number one, the book of Titus. Titus is right before you get to Hebrews. Uh, so you'll, uh, you'll look there in chapter number one this evening. I'm going to read an often quoted verse by religious people, and, but give you the uh, sense in which I want to use it tonight. Titus chapter number one. And uh, uh, we're, we're going to, I don't know, I know what my title is, but I know I'd like to title it something else. But anyway, it says this, Titus chapter number one. Um, verse 15, the last two verses of the, of the chapter of the book of Titus, chapter number one. He said, Under the pure, all things are pure, but under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Look at verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable and disobedient and under every good work reprobate. My goodness, that's an awful indictment upon a group of people here. And I want to use that tonight. See that word where it says they profess they know God, but in works they deny Him. I want to preach about profession without possession. And that's about Christians ought to live like Christians. Right? One of the worst things that hurt the church more than anything else is when they that profess to know God don't live for the Lord. Now, I, I want to say two things this, this evening, and, and I'm going to give you a, a, a short outline. First, I understand and believe that salvation is a gift. Salvation, you do not do anything to earn salvation. It is an absolute free gift. You don't do one thing to earn it. You do not do one thing to keep it. It is the gift of God. So there's all, when he preached like this, there's always somebody misinterpreting and saying that I'm trying to mix works in with salvation. No, I'm not. Salvation is a complete gift. We're talking about how you act after you're saved. That's what we're doing. We're not talking about to get saved. Uh, you know, you start preaching, Christians ought to do this, Christians ought to do that, and you always got somebody comes up and says, well, some people life don't change and others do and all of that. And I know people change at different degrees. People grow at different degrees depending on personal life, circumstances, whether it's raised, stuff like that. And I don't mean to associate anything good that you do with your salvation at all. Let's get that settled. Uh, salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I want to say also that I am not saying that uh, if a person don't live a certain way, that means they're not saved. There are people that believe that. There are people that believe, well, if you're doing this, there ain't no way you can be saved. No, there ain't no way. And you don't have a right to say that, and I don't either. Let me tell you something, people. Saved people can do some mighty stupid things, Amen. right? Saved people can do some mighty bad things. Uh, if I've heard people, uh, people say, if a person does this or that, they ain't no way they can be saved. And it's something they don't do. It's always something they don't do. Uh, and, uh, but, but the truth is tonight, saved people have done a lot of bad things. They, in the Bible they did. Uh, Peter cussed. Noah got drunk. David committed adultery and murder. All, I mean, all kinds of stuff. That don't make it right. I'm just saying a lot of times God's people have failures and sins in their life. And if you don't understand that, you're not even the first base in understanding the Bible. And, but, I'm, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about that. I don't believe that the people in this scripture that I read to you about are saved. It's not referring to saved people. It said they profess that they know God. Now, I'm not the judge. I don't know who's saved and who not. But I do know this. I believe that there's a lot of people in churches all across this country that claim to be God saved that have no idea. They wouldn't know God if they met him out there in the middle of the highway. And I'm, I'm not the judge. I'm not. But that book says that somebody professes they know God, but in works they deny him, being reprobate to every good work. Now, a hypocrite is somebody who never intends to be what they pretend to be. A hypocrite is not a Christian who falls, <coughs> excuse me, and repents and gets back up. 
<coughs> Excuse me. That's not the definition of a hypocrite. I don't know what I eat over there. It about kill me. I think it's that barbecue and dirt got in there somehow. But uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> anyway, a hypocrite is somebody who is a deliberate fake. A hypocrite's not somebody who falls and, and says, I'm sorry, and means it, and gets up, or falls again and repents and gets up. That's not a hypocrite. A man admits his mistakes and knows what he's done wrong and says, look, I'm wrong, I want to make it right. That's not a hypocrite. A hypocrite is somebody who deliberately leads the wrong kind of life and makes people think they're right when they have no intentions whatsoever of being right with God. That's a hypocrite. And a man said one time, he said, uh, a woman started to get him to come to church. He said, I ain't coming to church. There's too many hypocrites in there. She said, oh, come on. One more ain't going to hurt us. That's, that's the way it is. Ain't that right? Ain't that right? Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about profession without possession. In other words, they had to talk, but their walk didn't match their talk. You got a walkie, 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 and talkie, talkie, talkie. That's what you got to do. Uh, your, your walk must match your talk. So I want to say, first of all tonight, let me just name these things off. We'll go quick. There is no change. Where there is no change. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not creation like the new Bible say. That ain't true. It's creature. Sure, like the King James Bible said. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Now, when I got saved, that was very evident what that meant. When I got saved back in them days, and still today, when people get saved, they change. We're living in a day when people, rap singers are saved, rock singers are saved, uh, movie stars are saved, all of them, half of Hollywood claims to be saved. Listen, back in the old days, when a man got saved, he turned his back on that stuff. And there again, somebody will say, well, you're preaching works for something. No, I'm not. I'm talking about after you're saved, there's something in you that makes you want to turn from those evil works, people. I mean, I didn't, I hadn't been saved 24 hours until I quit cussing. You hear me? Some of you people still cuss. Now, it might be because you got a dirty heart, or it might be because you work around people that cuss all the time and you have to hear it and it gets in you. I might, you know, I might understand that a little bit. But there's something wrong with the people. Somebody's been saved for years and years and years still cusses. That's just one little tiny example. We used to cuss all the time and, and say words, you know, cuss words. And the night I got saved, we quit. Bam! Just like that. I like them little old songs like, Oh, don't look for me to go where I used to go before. I don't go there anymore. I found a better way. I like the old song people used to sing. You'll never hear this in the hill song in New York, brother. I guarantee you that. But today I went back to the place where I used to be. Uh, I, today I saw the same old crowd I knew before. When they asked me what had happened, I tried to tell them, Thanks to Calvary, I don't go here anymore. Anymore. You know, we sing that at Hillsong in New York. Lord, they go out and get drunk after the service, have a beer with the former pastor, and have all kinds of stuff like that going on. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be mean tonight. I'm not being judgmental. I'm going to tell you, hey, you kids, you say, I know the Lord. You know what the Lord do to you? He'll change you. You'll change. You don't change to get saved. You change because you are saved. A new Creature in Christ, in life, in looks. You don't want to look like him and him when you get right with God. You don't. You don't. And there's something wrong with you if you do. Let me just let me just say a couple things right here tonight. This this ain't in the message, and I may not even get to all of it. We all heard about little nausea and his uh, little tennis shoes to worship the devil, little nausea, whatever his name is, little nausea. And uh, I, I, I preached about it last week, and every preacher preached about it, and it blew my mind this week that we heard over and over about Christians taking up for that. Christian people taking up for that and talking bad about anybody. They were actually people online Listen to this, that we're blaming church and God and Christians 
for a little nauseous putting 666 six, six pairs of tennis shoes and making thousands of millions of dollars off the world telling them to worship Satan. Listen, people, I love that little guy. I'd get down right here and pray with him right now yeah. if, if, I, if, it, if it was here. I would. I would get down and say, I would do, I'd stay up all night if I thought I could help him. Don't you accuse us of not having love. Just because you preach against sin don't mean you don't have love. I mean, some, some of the most uh, unloving people in the world is these people that talk about Christians that don't have love. Listen, if you got love, come out and go on bus route Saturday. If you got love, try to help somebody out there on the street, some homeless person. If you got love, uh, go give out some tracts. Try to keep somebody out of hell. Having love don't mean you stand up here with honey dripping down both sides of your mouth and won't call sin a sin. I'm telling you tonight, brother, our sin is a sin. Sin is a sin. Sin is a sin. We don't advertise for 666. Christian, and it's not God's people's fault that he did that. It ain't God's people's fault. They said he was church damaged. Imagine. Let me tell you something, buddy. And you, everybody hears me online, I don't care. I, mean, I ain't mad at nobody. I don't even know who said all these things. People send them to me. But I'll tell you one thing. The last thing in the world you will ever be able to do is blame God's church for your li living wicked. Don't you blame the church. The church is the best thing on this earth. It ain't perfect. It ain't what it ought to be. But I'm telling you, this is our family. We are a part of God's family. And I, it is not the church's fault that a man makes tennis shoes with 666 on them. It ain't the church's fault. You crazy? You can't blame that. Everybody could blame that. I could say, well, my mom preached to me when I was little, so I rebelled and I become a murderer. You know, it ain't my mom's fault. It ain't the church's fault. You know why people sin? They choose to. That's right. That's, what, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. That's satanic to imply that church made that guy turn out like that. The truth is probably he had a mama or a grandma that preached to him and told him what was right and he rebelled till God turned him over to reprobate mind. You know if a person goes on and 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 sin, on and on and on and sin, there comes a point where something snaps. I, I don't know who is and who ain't, but I, according to the Bible, there are some people that have turned over to a reprobate mind. And I think it comes along with this philosophy of Accept yourself, accept yourself. And that's what they'll tell you. You go to a counselor and you say, well, I feel like I was, I've been uh, uh, gay all my life and I feel like I need a counselor and I need a counselor. And they'll tell you the first thing you've got to do is get rid of all guilt all the, and accept yourself and love yourself. And you finally convince yourself, my conscience ain't bothering me. It's something, something breaks. It's like something, like a rubber band snaps. And, and you say, I'm free. I'm woke. No, you ain't. God turned you loose, what he done. You're a reprobate mind. You're free to serve sin. Holy mercy, y'all don't get quiet on me now. Not, I'm, I'm just on, this is going to be a nice little sweet heart-to-heart -heart talk on, on Christmas. Uh, uh, Easter Sunday evening. I can't believe it. I can't believe that people blame the church. You know the you know the the, the uh, politicians and people are blaming the church for the the virus spread. They're blaming the church ain't our fault. Lord, blame China. That's where it come from. Say amen right there. It is the Wuhan flu. That makes me a racist. See, if I say that, they say, oh oh you're racist. Well, you're 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 there's something wrong with your brain. Amen, Brother Danny. Preaching. I ain't, I ain't run no popularity contest. I'm preaching the Word of God. That's my job. And I'm telling you, there's no change. There's something wrong. I love the song. Today I went back. Imagine that. Imagine that. Hill Song, New York. Today I went back to the place where I used to go. I, you know, my little boy, I come home, my little boy ran and hid behind the door. I said, Son, have no fear. You got a brand new daddy here. 
Thanks to Calvary, I don't come here anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I am not the man I used to be. I don't go, I'm not in real movies. I don't play rock and roll. I don't get drunk. I don't smoke pot. I don't, I don't I do this. I don't do that. We don't shack up. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. When they ask me what had happened, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't go here anymore. I want to say secondly this morning, this evening. It's been a long day since 535. There is no charity. There is no charity. There is no charity. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. Now, I, one thing that happened to me when I got saved, I started loving people, caring about people. Before I got saved, I never, ever remember helping people people, like poor people. I didn't pick up hitchhikers. I didn't, I didn't witness, I didn't try to help people that are homeless or on the side of the road. If somebody's car broke down, right after I got saved, we started picking up hitchhikers. We used to pick up every hitchhiker, no matter where. You don't see many hitchhikers out no more, and I still do it. I don't, I don't recommend it. If you don't want to do it, don't. But it's a lot more dangerous now than it was back then. Boy, you used to pick up. I, used to, I knew ever drunk and marrying for years and years and years. I picked them up. I thought they all knew me. We was all on a first-name basis. I mean, it's sort of like, as soon as I'd see them get in, I'd say, hey, John, hey, Bill. Hey, and they'd sit down over there. I'd crack the back windows about that much, turn on my fan, put it on fresh. <laughs> bring fresh air in, you know, and, and you know, and, and so it would blow between me and them, and and I'd say, "How you doing, buddy?" And oh, they look at me and they say, "Danny, I tell you one thing, buddy. If I ever go to church, you're going. I'm gonna come to your church." And sure enough, some of them did. You know what? They, I'd, I'd have never done that before I got saved. Never, never. I never tried to get. I would never give them a drunk money. Of course, I, I didn't give them that much. And I'd offer to buy them a hamburger. Or I'd say, I'll take you somewhere. I took people up to, toward Asheville. I took people to Hickory. And I noticed that, Lord, I didn't used to do this. I didn't used to do this. I started caring about people. And Mom used to tell me, she said, Danny, you can't help everybody. And I said, Mom, I know I don't. But I'm, one of the ways I know I got saved is I started really caring about people. And I still do. I still do. I care about people. And by the way, people know it when the preacher cares about people. You know it. It ain't because I scream and holler at you like I did there a minute ago. You can tell it when somebody cares. And I and I care about people. I just I I have ever since I got saved. I I didn't uh, I I loved to hold my, my pastor taught me this. He they said, Well, what if you help somebody? I had a hitchhiker steal my billfold one time and had fifty dollars in it. Back when fifty dollars was like a whole paycheck now. And I had I I played ball or something, I put my wallet up under the seat. And it slid back there, and I picked this old boy up in Marion, and after he's gone, I got to look at my wallet, and it was gone. You say, well, didn't that make you want to go? Well, I wasn't happy about it, but the Lord blessed me. I bet you never did pick up a nut. I sure did, and I sure will. It's okay. It's okay. Don't say, well, I tried to help one of them drunks one time, and I saw him down there drunk the next night. Anyway, listen, my pastor taught me this. Listen to me. He said, God will never hold it against you for trying to help somebody. If they take advantage of you, of your kindness and goodness, if you babysit for somebody and they go get drunk, or if you try to help somebody out and they take, your, take advantage of your situation, God will not hold that against you. He will always bless you for trying to help somebody else. I love the church. I wanted to go to church when I got saved. I wanted to go to church. I worry about people that use every little excuse, like Easter, like, like anything to miss church, good weather, bad weather. It bothers me that pe the least little thing, well, I think I'll just stay home now. There, listen, you say, well, I don't think the preacher ought to just cram it down people so we don't have to. No, I don't either. I think you ought to love the Lord and the preaching and the, and the congregating enough to desire to come to church. Something's wrong if a person don't want to go to church, they either ain't got a church worth going to or they ain't right with God. 
if you got a good church, you ain't right with God. And if you ain't got a good church, you, you, you might have a little leg stand on there. I don't blame some people not wanting to go to what they have to listen to every Sunday. But I'm telling you people, listen, when I got right with God, I wanted to go to church. I'll never forget Larry Brown, the, uh, the old Larry Brown. You know, he's retired now from down there in North Houston. And Brother Larry, he's his character, just an absolute character. Uh, great preacher, great preacher. And he's up in years now, and he don't get to travel like he used to. But he said when he first got saved, he said he for, when he first got saved, he was just an old dumb country boy like we call ourselves, you know. And he said, I went in there. He said, I seen people doing this. I seen people being an usher. He said, I want a job. He said, I want to do something in the church. Uh, he said, preacher, put me, put me doing something. I want a position. I want to do something. I want to be important. Like everybody, I want to serve the Lord. I want to put He said, you know what they done? He said to the preacher, he said, now, Mr. Brown, he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We are going to put you in charge of the steeple inspection committee. That's right. Steeple inspection committee. Now, if you've never been to Old Southern Baptist Church, you don't understand that. But in them Old Southern Baptist churches, they have a committee for everything. Everything's run by a committee. No such thing as that in the Bible. They just made it up. I mean, everything. They say a horse is a camel that's really put together by a Baptist committee. A committee is unqualified and unnecessary to read the minutes and waste the hours. That's what a committee is. Uh, but you know what? Uh, they said, uh, uh, he said, now, Mr. Brown, you are going to be in charge of the steeple inspection. He said, now, you keep, you inspect the steeple once in a while, and whenever it needs paint, you tell us, we'll have a paint crew come in here and paint it. He said, I got on that job. He said, I told my wife, you get ready early. We're going to be there 15 minutes early. He said, Sunday morning, we pulled up in the parking lot. We drove in there. I got out. He said, I looked at that steeple. I went all the way around it. He, he said, I looked at it. He said, I walked right in the pastor's office. He said, Pastor, the steeple looks good this morning. He said he did that every Sunday. <laughs> every Sunday. I mean, that wasn't what he asked for. But you know what? You know what that man was? He just got saved. He loved the Lord, and he appreciated just to get to do anything for God. Oh, how we miss them days. How we miss those days when it's new and it's fresh. And people say, I want to do something for God. Now it's like uh, people say, well, I'll do something for the Lord. What do you need? The, oh, not that. Preacher came to me one time up, up, up in, in Marion. And he was a, a preacher and preached around a lot of different places. I didn't have no problem with the guy. I liked the guy. But he came up to me one time. I was going to be going off preaching somewhere. And he said, uh, well, uh. Uh, you need you need anything you need anything done while you're gone? Well, he's wanting to preach that Wednesday night. I can tell. And he said, uh, "Need anything done while you're gone? Uh, anything I can do for you?" And I said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "Okay, I'd be glad to, brother." I said, uh, "If you come here and help these people go visit him Thursday night, I'd sure appreciate it." And he turned around, and walked off, and never did go visit. Him. And that I'll never forget that he wanted to preach when I wasn't there but he didn't even want to do what I asked him to. And I thought, Lord, what's, what's wrong? This guy could have. It ain't like he couldn't. He's very knowledgeable, knew the Bible backwards and forward, but he thought that's a little beneath me. I'm a little above that. I'm a little too spiritual for that. I love it when a person first gets saved. They may not know Old Testament from New Testament. They just say, glory to God, preacher, I'll be on a steeple inspection committee. I just want to do something for Jesus. There is no charity. There is no cleansing. Like I said, nobody told me to stop cussing. The blood cleanses. The book cleanses. There is no comfort. Amen. I'm telling you, there is no comfort. When there's profession without possession, there's no comfort. There's no comfort. There's no power. There's no... Listen, when I first got saved... Uh, it's, it's amazing to me. And I'm, I, I'm just like the rest of you men. I struggle with it. I, when you first get saved, you have all zeal and no knowledge. You want to do everything, and you ain't got no sense. But something happens over the years. By the time you got the sense, you lose your zeal. 
And if we could ever keep our zeal and knowledge, we'd be dangerous. Right, man? Right? It's true. I'm, I struggle with it all the time. I ain't fussing at you. I fight the same flesh you fight right here. Every week. Every week is right here. I fight it all the time. And uh, I, I remember... I remember when I first got saved, I thought, glory to God, hallelujah. And the Lord blessed the power, and we used to pray. We'd get together, and we'd pray, and it wasn't like we'd say, all right, we're going to pray 10 minutes. Oh, God. And you look at what, it's been five. Oh, I pray a little. Oh, it's been seven. Uh, and I'm, I'm not against that because we did it here the other night. But you remember the good old days when you just prayed and you didn't even care or even know how long you'd you get up and say, oh, my goodness, has it been 15, 20 minutes? That's, that's, I, remember, I remember hearing a story about one time they come to church and the preacher is getting ready to preach and they're making the announcements and, and there was, everybody was coming in. And all of a sudden, electricity went off. And they, somebody went down here trying to get it on. Somebody went over here trying to get it on. They didn't know if they had blowed the breaker somewhere. Something went out, uh, out, out in the yard or parking lot or somewhere. And, they, and finally, they, they said, well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Let's, let's pray. And while the preacher was praying, the, 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 the uh, janitor come in and slipped a little note in there. And he said, after prayer, the power will be on. And he said, uh, somebody found out what was wrong with it out there. And he said, after prayer, the power will be on. After prayer, the power comes on. After prayer, the power comes on. Listen, we're going to have people here on drugs at the youth rally. We're going to have people here that are living all kinds of wicked ways. Brother Ronnie, the bus man down there, he's going to bring a crowd on Saturday night on the 24th. And, and there, we'll probably put them right over here in this section. He'll probably have 40 or 50 or something like that. And listen, them people need the Lord. You know what they need? Power. After prayer, the power come on. I'm begging y'all. I'm begging y'all. Pray for me. Pray with me. Pray for me. Pray with me. Let's get in our prayer closet. It'll be over in two, two weeks from Friday. This thing will be over. Two, three weeks from tonight, the youth rally will be over, y'all. It'll be over. The last service, three weeks from tonight. Can Let's give up some time. Let's give up some food. Let's give up some entertainment. Let's give up some pleasure and push the plate back or turn the TV off or something get in our prayer clothes and say oh God after prayer the power come on after prayer the power come wouldn't you like to see the Holy Ghost come and do a miracle in our church and, and change I mean people genuinely getting saved after prayer the power comes on that's right you can do it I'm going to try y'all help me pray with me and for me there is no chastening there is no chastening. According to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 8, if God don't chastise you when you do wrong, you're not even a child of his. Have you ever been to Walmart or somewhere and what somebody else is kidding you think, boy, if that was my young, and we've all done that, right? And they probably looked at ours the same way. But you look at the fact my little boy, I'd tear that rear end up, you know, right like that. But we don't. They ain't our kids. And I know, pre I know pre preachers that disagree with me about this. They don't believe God chastises children, even though the Bible says he does. They, one man told me like this. He said, well, he said, well, we're the bride of Christ. Jesus don't beat his wife. And I thought, you know, I thought that's crazy. That's crazy. Listen, Jesus being the bridegroom and the church being the bride, that's only one analogy. There's others. There's the father's son. Jesus don't beat his wife, but the father spanks his children. Amen. We're not just the bride of Christ. We are the father's children. You can't, you can't just find one truth and run with it like that because you'll be teaching false doctrine. We are the bride-to-be of Christ. We are. Well, I heard a man preaching against that the other day, a great Baptist preacher on the radio. He said, he said, there's no word in the Bible where it says we're the bride of Christ. I said, well, Listen, man, you, you're sort of right and sort of. We are espoused. We are not married to him. We are espoused. That means we're engaged. This is the engagement period. One day he'll present us as a bride for a husband and we'll be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are also sons and daughters of God the Father. And God the Father, that's what the Hebrew said, chastens his children. Not his wife. He chastens his children. Put it this way. 
If you can go do anything, anytime, everything, and feel no kind of guilt, no kind of conviction, no kind of spanking, there's something wrong with your salvation. Amen. 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 Now, I'm telling you, buddy, I, I listen, I've failed the Lord many a time, and, buddy, he knocked my brains out when I sinned. He does. I mean, how many of you ever been took to the woodshed? I, and you know it too. People say, well, how do you know it's the Lord? You know when the Lord's whipping you. And by the time he's through, you're thanking him for it. Thank you, Lord. I deserved every bit of it. And Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then he'll say, all right, get up and go on. Take it like a man. Take it like a, a woman. And say, I'll take my whipping and I'll move on. Listen, kids, if you're saved, you can't go out and fool around. You can't play around with with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You listen? You can't do that without God spanking you. It may not be the next minute. A lot of times it is. A lot of times you'll have a a blowout or a car wreck right down the road sometimes. Sometimes it may be a year. It'll get you. It'll get you. Lord, my daddy, my daddy wasn't even saved. Boy, I'm telling you one thing. You've heard me tell that story before. When I set that fire in the basement, I was about five years old, four. I wanted a cigarette ladder so bad I couldn't. A cigarette ladder was my dream gift. Ain't times changed, buddy. You buy that for 79 cents back in. Now they want $800 video games. I wanted a cigarette lighter. I thought cigarette, I still like cigarette lighters. I do. I just think that's cool. You can just do like that and make a fire. And I set a fire in the basement, and Mom smelled it upstairs. She come running out, Danny, what? And I couldn't have been. It was in Clinksville, and we moved when I was six, so I was probably five. People say you can't remember nothing when you're five years old. You can too, buddy. I was five years old. Wasn't too much bigger than Frank. And uh, she said, all right, son, I'm telling your daddy. Daddy was, I don't know where he was. He never was there. He's, he's, he's working or gone with running dogs all the time, all the time, running coon dogs or, or working. He, and, you know, when you're little, you go all evening. It's time to go to bed. You think, I got away with it. Well, that night I went to bed. I'm telling you, buddy, 1130 or 12 o'clock at night, and I was in a dead sleep. The light came on. I'm like, bam! I felt something just grab my ankle like it right there. Picked me up and it started to beat me. Went, bam! Bam! I didn't even know. I thought I died in my tail. I thought, hell, look! I mean, you're asleep. You say, now that ain't no way to do it, kid. No, it probably ain't. Probably ain't. I'll tell you one thing. I never did set no more fires in the basement. It worked. Some of our parents, they might have not disciplined exactly right, but it worked better than this modern day stuff of let's take him to a counselor and, and see why he set the fire in the basement. He set a, he set a fire and it burned too. <laughs> it burned me and, and I learned my lesson. And that's the way the Lord is. The Lord will teach you a lesson once in a while. It's not for his pleasure. It's for your benefit. Nobody, no parent, in, or you shouldn't, enjoys whipping you. If you enjoy it, there's something wrong with you. Really, you, you're sick. If you're a real discipline of a kid, you don't want to do it. You know, the old saying is, now, son, this is going to hurt me. Boy, that, ain't, that ain't true. <laughs> One boy looked up at his dad and said, all right, let me have that belt in. If it's going to hurt you worse than it does me. That ain't really true. But it does hurt us. It does hurt us to have to spank kids, don't it? It does. If, you, if it don't, you ain't doing it right. Man, I, I used to hate to have to do that. I have one sitting there tonight. Deserved many more beatings than she got. <laughs> yeah, but no, she didn't. She didn't. She did good, really, most of the time. And you know what? There's no chastening. If you be without chastisement, you're bastards and not sons. What the Bible says. You're not even a real child of God. You're an illegitimate Christian sitting in church. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. That's right. Now, the jails, detention centers, rehab, women's shelters are filled with saved people. Not everybody in there, but a lot. Saved people. 
that just kept disobeying and kept disobeying. I promise you, there's the drug rehab are full of people that really got saved and really done good for a while and just got out there and lived wicked and wild. And the Lord said, okay, here you go. You're not going to live wicked and not pay a price for it if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're not going to live wicked and not pay a price. He said, you're going to do it. He loves you too much to just let you run wild and do whatever you want to where there is no chastening. All right, I'm through tonight. I don't want to stand before God being a professor and not being a possessor. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Let's stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's talking. Tonight, maybe the Lord has put his finger on something in your heart. Maybe God spoke to you about something. Young lady, young man, mom or dad. And you feel like tonight you ought to just slip right out of your seat, make your way down here to this altar and do business with him. That's right. Come on, boys. That's good. That's good. How about it, Daddy? How about it, Mama? You're not responsible for what your brother did or your sister did. You're responsible for what you do. What you do. You need to come? Come on right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word that keeps us in line. Thank you for your discipline upon us when we need it. Lord, we don't enjoy it, but we know it's necessary. Help us to appreciate you loving us and caring about us. Do what ought to be done right now. Touch and change lives. Help us to live for you every day. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen. Some come, you come on right now. Somebody else, come on right now. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. Amen. I am the clay. Come on now. Mold me and make me after thy will. Say it now. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Everybody, help me now. Have thine own way. me and try me master today amen whiter than snow lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly I bow she's playing softly tonight so I'm still praying now uh, we need to go ahead and get these out. It's two weeks from Friday, so we need to go ahead and be getting these out of here. Put one on your refrigerator, where you'll see it seven times a day, or on your TV where you see it 24 hours a day. And uh, take one of these if you live uh, near the post office, convenience store, somewhere where they have a bulletin board, or at work, school, somewhere. Get these. Don't waste them. They cost, but take these and put them out. We are going to organize three teams, visitation teams of teenagers in the next couple of weeks and hit the streets. Uh, Lenore, uh, uh, Walmart over there, Granite Falls, Lenore, Morganton, Hickory. It's cover the whole area with tracks and these, these little ones like that. And so take they put one in your car window at work. If you got a, if you got a, uh, a bench or somewhere at work, the sign phantom has already struck. I've already had several people. Have you seen the sign phantom? See, I just one work of me and Ethan. You wait till this week. The sign phantom is going to strike tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. It's going to get worse. Nobody knows it. No, it's done in secret in the dark like the rapture. And, and, and so it's fun. Man, we have fun uh, putting up them signs. So we got more... I got some over in my office. If you live near a good intersection where there's a convenience store, get me one of them youth rally signs over here. 
Amen. Um, tonight. Uh, <laughs> hurry. Uh, hey, uh, there you go. Thank you. Um, you can put these. Now, what what we do, if you're coming down an intersection, you, you can get on a tree and nail them to that tree, and they do real good. Or you can use those little things. We got them in there, the little steel things. You stick in the ground, but you put them up against a post or a stop sign or something, and then tie a string around it so the wind won't blow it. Don't just put it out here in the grass or the state pe people that mow the grass will just throw it in the ditch. So you put it right up against the, uh, the telephone bowl or something like we got over there at Walmart. Uh, now, if you'll do that, these things are expensive, so we can't waste them. But if you'll take one of these and put them, if you live near a, a corner where there's a lot of cars stop, uh, well, let's do that. I think we got we got eight or ten more of them in here. Let's get do these tonight. Make sure it's at a busy place. Don't just don't just waste them because they're they're expensive. And then take these. It's time to advertise the youth rally. Now I tell you what we're gonna do. I've had I don't know how many people push me. The camera's off. <laughs> 